This evening's reading comes from Deuteronomy chapter 10, page 189. It's verse 1 to verse 22. At that time, the Lord said to me, Chisel out two stones like the first ones and come up to me on the mountain. Also make a wooden ark. I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Then you are to put them in the ark. So I made the ark out of acacia wood and chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones. And I went up on the mountain and with the two tablets in my hands. The Lord wrote on these tablets what he had written before, the Ten Commandments he had proclaimed to you on the mountain, out of the fire, on the day of the assembly. And the Lord God gave them to me. Then I came back down the mountain and put the tablets in the ark I had made, as the Lord commanded me. And they are there now. The Israelites travelled from the wells of Beni Jachan to Mosorah, There Aaron died and was buried, and Eleazar, his son, succeeded him as priest. From there they traveled to Gudgoda and on to Jotbatha, a land with streams of water. At that time the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to stand before the Lord to minister and pronounce blessings in his name as they still do today. That is why the Levites have no share or inheritance among their fellow Israelites. The Lord is their inheritance, as the Lord your God told them. Now I had stayed on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, as I did the first time, and the Lord listened to me at this time also. It was not his will to destroy you. Go, the Lord said to me, and lead the people on their way so that they may enter and possess the land that I swore to their ancestors to give them. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good, To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. Yet the Lord set his affection on your ancestors and loved them. And he chose you, their descendants, above all the nations, as it is today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. Fear the Lord your God and serve him. Hold fast to him and take your oaths in his name. He is your praise. He is your God who performed for you those great and awesome wonders you saw with your own eyes. Your ancestors who went down into Egypt were 70 in all. And now... The Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars in the sky. This is the word of the Lord. Well, thank you, Neil. That's a, it's lovely to hear you read. Um, it's lovely to be here too. Um, it's lovely to be here with you. I think well, most of you probably know we're, we're as a family, we're in, in the morning service most of the time, but it's always a joy for me to come and be with you on a Sunday evening. And we're continuing this, as we've just heard, in in, in God's Word in Deuteronomy 10. And the question that I want us to think about this evening is, what does your God ask of you? What does your God ask of you? I guess that's a, a pretty fundamental question for us as Christians, isn't it? What does it mean for us to, to live as God's people? What does God require of us? 
As his ambassadors here in Cockfosters, perhaps as you're dealing with a difficult colleague tomorrow in the office, as you're sitting at your kitchen table, as your summer plans are being made, what does the Lord your God ask of you? I'm going to let you in on a slightly embarrassing uh, tale uh, of my Tuesday morning. Uh, I spent four hours uh, on a course in the Holiday Inn in Elstree on Tuesday morning. Uh, You might wonder why. Uh, Well, the Holiday Inn in Elstree is one of the police-approved driver awareness course venues. (laughs) Now, we all have our excuses when we have been caught speeding, don't we? Um, The truth of the matter is I was probably doing a little bit too fast. Uh, driving down a dual carriageway uh, at Easter in Wales. And sure enough, the letter landed on the doormat. Um, and here was the choice. You can, you can take the three points, you can take the penalty, uh, or you can just leave, uh, a clean slate. But to get the clean slate, well, what do you need to do? Is you need to come to the course, you need to pay attention, you need to listen, uh, you need to participate, you need to engage, you need to stay all the way to the end. And if you can do all the things that you're asked, well, then you can have a clean slate. So... You can imagine the scenes in Elstree at 7.45 in the morning. Everyone there ready to do their bit. Uh, But the atmosphere, well, to be honest, it was pretty flat. Uh, Lots of people there were pretty reluctant to be there. Um, Perhaps resentful even that their Tuesday mornings, uh, their their breakfast wake-up was to be at the Holiday Inn in Elstree uh, for four hours on the highway code. Uh, But they knew that they needed to be there and do their bit. Now, I guess the danger is that we can start to to live for God a little bit like that. We know that we're called to to obey God, to to love our neighbors, to open up our our homes. But even in the midst of that, even in the midst of serving our Lord, as we do what God calls us to do, I wonder if that reluctance, that resentment even, perhaps can creep in to our hearts, whether we'd really rather not be put to the trouble of cooking for for a group of people or, or giving up our time to meet someone who really needs to talk. Or for you, perhaps it's the idea of obedience to God. Well, it, can, it can feel like a, an exercise in, in knowing where the boundaries are. There are areas of our lives where maybe obedience perhaps can, can feel like it's sticking to the speed limits. We want to know how close we can get to the limits uh, whilst keeping on the right-hand side of God. But for others, maybe you know the reality of the Christian life. Well, it's a world away from simply keeping the highway code. As you see everything that God's done for you, you just want to know what it is that he wants of you. What does the Lord, your God, ask of you? I don't know if you heard, as, as, as Neil was reading for us, that same question is the one that Moses takes to, to Israel in verse 12. He says, now Israel, what does the Lord, your God, ask of you? And he goes on to give the answer. He says, but to fear the Lord, your God, to walk in obedience to him to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I'm giving you today for your own good. What does the Lord ask of us? Well, we might say simply, he wants our hearts. He wants us to to give our hearts over to him. Hearts that, that long for him alone. Hearts that live for him alone. Those verses 12 and 13, they give us, if you like, the the blueprint for living faithfully as one of God's people. Fear, walk, love, serve and observe. It's not a a list that we tick off, more a a five-part harmony that springs up from our hearts, that sings a song of what it is to live for our God the rest of chapter 10, it helps us to, to unpack these verses. It teaches us about the, the hearts that the Lord is asking for from us. And there, there's two points for us uh, as we continue in chapter 10 tonight. The first is, he asks for hearts that beat only for him. And the second point is that our hearts are to be those that are changed only by him. Hearts that beat only for him and hearts that are changed only by him. Well, if you've been here for our series in Deuteronomy, you remember that Israel is standing on the boundary, on the border of the promised land, and not really very much happens in Deuteronomy apart from Moses speaking. 
He gives sermons to Israel. He's preparing them for life in the land. He's preparing them for a life of faithfulness. That's what he calls them to, faithfulness to their God in the land. Last week, chapter 9, Moses was telling them the story of the golden calf uh, back at Mount Sinai. Uh, Moses, will remember, was up the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments from God. Well, down the bottom, there was Israel crafting their own idol of gold, worshipping it and rebelling against the Lord their God. And yet in the face of that rebellion, well, in his mercy, God still listened. He still listened to Moses' prayer for the people, and he didn't destroy them. And so that's where we are as chapter 10 starts. And Moses continues the, the history lesson, if you like. Uh, he, he describes how God gave Israel a second chance. If we see verses 1 and 2, it's like God is pressing reset. He's pressing the restart on the relationship. It's a, a renewal of the covenant. So he gives Two new tablets, just like the first ones. And he, he gives ten words, ten commandments, just like the first. The picture is one of covenant renewal. So despite the sin of Israel, well, God holds out his hand, as if you like, and he, he offers the hand of marriage to Israel again. He says, I will be your God, so be my people. And we see verse 11 the call to, to head on into the land is there. Moses is to bring the people towards the land that, he has, that God has promised to give them. So as we come to verse 12, well, we're, we're back in the present day, if you like, the present day for Israel on the border. And Moses' lesson for them from history is don't do what they did. When you get into the land, don't make that mistake. Verse 12, fear the Lord as you should. That's, that's a fear that's not, a, not an empty terror, not a sort of craven worry about God, but a, but a right fear, a reverence of the God. We heard in our verses, didn't we? He's mighty, he's awesome, he's great, he rules over all. That's the fear that Moses calls Israel to. It's a fear that, that means they shouldn't worship anything else. Put away your idols, he says, and love him, serve him, give your hearts to him alone. And we see, as we read on in verse 16, it's the same message, isn't it? Circumcise your hearts, he says. Don't be stiff-necked any longer. Well, it's, it's increasingly years and years ago now when I played rugby, but I always remember I dreaded the first game of the season uh, as the body readjusts to the sort of torment of, of multiple physical assaults on it. Uh, the next morning was always the worst. And the, the pain, the stiffness, it sort of starts down here and it just rises all the way up through the neck. I guess if you've woken up with a crick in your neck, you'll know that feeling. It's, it's, it's like this. You hear someone calling out to you from the left and you sort of, you sort of do this, don't you? But you, you, you can't even bear to sort of turn your head and look. And that, that's the picture that Moses wants us to see of Israel. That's the, the picture of, of, of how they are with God's voice. They're stubborn. They, they won't listen. They don't want to turn and hear what God has to say to them. What's needed, says Moses, is a change of heart. So those, those, those words, circumcise your hearts. Well, that means uh, for Israel, we've got this context of, of external circumcision, the, promise, uh, the sign that was given to, to Abraham. And what Moses is saying here is, is, well, actually, it's not just the external observance that your God wants from you. He wants a heart that is set apart for him. If you like, all the things that stand between the heart and faithfulness to God. Well, Moses is saying, cut them away. Cut them away so that you'll have a heart that beats for me alone. I guess, Moses, if we, if we look around at the world today, at our society, at the institutions that govern our country... Uh, in our workplaces. I guess we're, we look at places where God is increasingly ignored rather than feared. The God who rules over every square inch of the universe is little loved by those who he set in authority. He's little loved by those setting the social agenda. And what do we see as a result? Well, we see society fractures. We see a nation that lives not for God, but for themselves. Rather than lives of loyalty, of service and obedience, well, there's life of self, isn't there? Individual living, self-promotion. 
and all around us an implosion of, of those good, God-given ethics uh, as, we, as we see the, the patterns of modern lifestyles, modern relationships. Perhaps a little bit closer to home, and as we look at some parts of, of the church today in the, in the UK, too often the, the social, the political agenda, that is setting the spiritual agenda. It's as if it's the idols of the age, if you like, that have captured hearts. So God is, is recast as we'd like him to be, rather than being revered for who he is. His word but too often is reinterpreted to fit the culture of the day, rather than being observed because it comes from the God of God and Lord of Lords, because it is for our good, and yet it is ignored. We must keep praying for our nation. We must keep praying for God's church in our country. And yet as we read of Israel's idolatry, well, I think we also need to ask ourselves, don't we, what are the idols that live in our hearts? What are our heart competitors, if you like, for God? It's not likely to be a golden calf, I suppose. We don't see too many of those in our living rooms these days. But our idols will be the things that the culture around us tells us will satisfy us, the things that will keep us safe, the things that will make us happy. You'll know your hearts. You'll know where those areas are for you. I'm sure you will. They'll be in the pattern of our lives. They'll be in our, our living rooms. They'll be in our relationships. They're in all the things that compete for our heart, that compete for our affections, the things that we lie awake worrying about the reasons that we, that we snap at our loved ones. Because it's our own desire for an easy life trumps our desire for God. For some of us, I guess the danger is that we'll make idols of, of our careers or our ambitions. Our priorities will put God second in the queue or third or fourth. And for us as a family, we've got kids in, in school, in primary school. We find it can be so easy to fall into idolizing schooling, idolizing uh, a bright future for them ahead of a bright spiritual future. Focusing on what's best for them here and now rather than what's best for them eternally. Rather than what, what, asking what is going on in their hearts. And the point of, of all of that is to say that if our hearts wander, well, our obedience to God will wander too. and We won't, we won't hold up. Hearts that, that beat for God will drive lives that live for God. I always remember when I was starting out as a, as a young Christian in my 20s, uh, a guy came got alongside me, a guy called John, uh, and he was a wonderful guy. Uh, he, he, he helped me to, to get a handle on, on the scriptures. He, he, he led a life that showed me what it, what it was to be a godly man uh, in your 20s. And it was clear from his life, it wasn't just that he wanted to do the right thing. There was a, there was a warmth, there was a, a deep-rooted love for God, a, a love that took God's word seriously because he knew it was for his good. Look down at, at verse 20. Do you see everything, says Moses, is to be focused in on God. Fear the Lord your God. Serve him. Hold fast to him. Take your oaths in his name. He is the one you praise. He is your God. Those words, hold fast. It's, it's the, the superglue word, if you like, of the Old Testament. It's the word that, that is used in Genesis 2 as the man leaves his family and holds fast to his wife, cleaves uh, to his wife. It's a picture of, of unity. It's the closest possible thing. And that's, if you like, the message uh, for our hearts Hearts that are about him, about him, about him. No one else, nothing else is worthy of our hearts. What does the Lord your God ask of you? Well, he asks for hearts that beat only for him. I don't know about you, but as we, as we hear those words, as we hear what it is that God asks for from us, it can feel like quite a challenge, can't it? It can feel like quite a high bar. Uh, perhaps you're here thinking, yeah, I can see that that's what God wants of me, but surely that's an impossible task. Perhaps, uh, perhaps you've had a tough week. Maybe uh, 
you've messed up in, in an area of your life. Perhaps you've been short with your spouse. Or perhaps you've, you've caught yourself again uh, indulging in the gossip at the school gate or uh, in, in the office. And perhaps it's the content that we know that we shouldn't look at on our tablets. Well, whatever it is, it can sometimes feel, can't it, that that spiral, it just feels an impossible one to break free of. We just don't seem able to change. So we hear God, God's call for hearts that beat for him alone, and yet we find that it's just so hard to change. We heard Moses saying to Israel in verse 16, circumcise your hearts, make an inward change. And yet, yet if we know Israel's story, well, we know that's exactly the thing that they fail to do. So as they head into the land, well, they'll persist in, in their stiff-necked behaviors. They'll, they'll persist in their sin. And what is the end result? Well, they're marched back out of the land by God's enemies. The prophet Jeremiah, he said of, of Israel, uh, Jeremiah 9, 26, is the whole house of Israel is uncircumcised in heart. So the call from Moses, circumcise your heart, the reality of Israel whole house uncircumcised in heart. And that diagnosis is, if you like, the diagnosis of our hearts. We have the same heart problem, if you like. We were, we were born with stubborn hearts. We are born with hearts that, that won't change, left to ourselves. Well, we'll head in the same direction. And yet, wonderfully, in God's grace, the story, it doesn't end there. If you keep a, a finger in chapter 10, come, come with me to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Here we're reading of, of God's promises to a future Israel, that future Israel in exile. So the opening verses of chapter 30, God is, is, is promising to restore his people. He's promising to, to bless them. And then these words in Deuteronomy 30. Verse 6, I'll give you a moment to find it. Moses says, The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. So we see the, the pattern. God's people won't change. They won't love him on their own. So God says, I will circumcise your hearts so that you may love me. As we read forward in, in the Bible, we see the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel, they pick up on this. They speak about a day when God will take away hearts of stone and he will give his people new spirit-filled hearts. And as we read on in, in the New Testament, well, we see those promises fulfilled in Jesus. He is if you like, the true Israel. He is the one that keeps the blueprint of Deuteronomy 10, verse 12 and 13, fear, serving, love, obedience. He is the one who fulfills all of those things as he loves and serves his heavenly Father. And as he returns to his Father, he sends the Spirit to live in us, to give us new hearts, hearts that, that turn from sin, hearts that would love him and live for him. The Apostle Paul puts it like this in Romans 5. He says, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. We can't change our own hearts, but God promises to change hearts of those who call on him and trust in him. Well, the last few weeks, we had some very exciting news in our family. Amy and I were asked to be uh, godparents for one of our, our good friend's uh, children. His name's Tobias. Uh, we went to see him uh, last weekend uh, down in South London. Uh, we're very thankful uh, for Tobias. We're very thankful that he is with us at all, actually. Uh, so his parents found out during the pregnancy uh, that Tobias had a problem with one of the, the valves in his heart. And so, a week after he was born, uh, baby Tobias was on the operating table under the anesthetic for five hours, uh, having surgery to help repair uh, his faulty heart. And praise God, the, the operation, it was successful. And so, last weekend, what did we see? We saw a, a lovely crying, feeding, sleeping, uh, happy baby. As I've spent time in, in Deuteronomy this week, I've been thinking about Tobias. I've been thinking about 
my own heart. You'd be thinking how, like, well, like Tobias, well, my heart problem is something that I can't do anything about on my own. And yet, as God gives me his spirit, well, he fixes my heart. And just as, Toby's, uh, as Tobias' life depended on, on that operation at a week old, well, so our lives, indeed our eternal destinies, are transformed by God's grace. His grace to us as he, as he gives new hearts to us. Hearts that are, that are able to love him, to fear him, as we should. To serve him, as we should. Hearts even to have faith in the forgiveness that was won for us by our Lord Jesus. If you're here as someone who wouldn't perhaps call themselves a believer, or perhaps you have doubts, perhaps you have uh, questions about the God of the Bible, well, I hope you've seen uh, from Deuteronomy 10 today that the Christian life, it's not a, a life of rules. It's not the highway code. It's a loving relationship with the God of heaven. A relationship with a God who so loved the world that he sent his only son to die for us. The God who gives us new hearts to love him with. That's a precious truth, isn't it, for us too as Christians. We need to keep reminding ourselves the Holy Spirit dwells in us, dwells in our hearts. And so by God's strength, through the Spirit, we can give our hearts over to him. It means that we have choices to make with our hearts each day. So as we stand in our wilderness, as we stand in in the wilderness of life here, as we look on to our promised land, as we step forwards toward it, to an eternal future with God, well, he empowers us to live for him. Yes, we'll, we'll still fall short. We won't love him perfectly. But he's given us his spirit that we might be made holy, we might be set apart from the world, for him. So in his strength, with his help, we can turn from sin, we can confront uh, the idols in our lives, and we can choose to love him. When we talk about loving God, we're not talking about the, the sort of warm fuzzies, the feeling of the newlyweds. We're talking about a, a, a deep soul commitment. Perhaps think more of the, the couple who've been together for half a century celebrating their jubilee and gazing lovingly, deeply, allegiance that is between them after half a century together. Loving God is like that. It's a heart allegiance. It's a faithfulness to him alone. God calls for hearts that overflow with thankfulness. I guess as we see how, how great his love for us is in the Lord Jesus, as we see how he chooses us and loves us, forgives us, we see the goodness of his word. Hearts that beat for him alone. And of course, the, the Christian life, it's not a solo pursuit. Our midweek groups here, are, they're a great place. I've been really blessed this year to, 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 be, to have joined a, a small group here. And it, it's, a, it's a wonderful place to come together, isn't it? To hear God's word, uh, to, to be able to pray for one another, to be able to encourage one another, to get alongside one another in the, in, the, in the travails of life, the difficulties of life, and live with one another for God. And God gives us, a, beyond that, a church family to, to love us, to encourage us, to hold us accountable for our lives. He doesn't want us to, to keep our idols in our hearts, to keep them locked behind closed doors. He wants, them, he wants them put on the table. He wants us to seek his help. He wants us to seek the help of our brothers and sisters here at Christchurch. So perhaps you might want to ask yourself, what are, what are those things in your life where... Actually, it would be better to put them on the table. What are these things that would be better to say, actually, brother and sister in Christ, help me here. Help me to love God in this area. Help me to love God with this challenge that I'm facing. What does God ask of us? He wants our hearts. He wants our hearts to beat for him alone. And with, with new hearts, God empowers us. By his grace, we can love him. We can serve him. We can live for him. Let's reflect on those words of verse 20 again as we, as we close. Fear the Lord your God and serve him. Hold fast to him. 
Take your oaths in his name. He is the one you praise. He is your God. Well, in a few moments, James is going to come and lead us in communion, but perhaps before he does, uh, we'll just take a few moments now in the quiet of your hearts just to reflect uh, on God's word to us this evening. As we, as, we, as we come to the Lord's table, as we think about what it is that the Lord Jesus has done for us, uh, as we come to share in a, a covenant meal together as his people, perhaps just take a few moments in your hearts now uh, to reflect on what it is that God has been saying to you this evening. Amen. Mm-hmm.